Greetings, boils, ghouls, and all of the macabre manner of being. It's your old buddy Oxley Mations here, bringing forth to you, for the first time ever, Oxtoberfest! <laughs> A macabre little series I have concocted, in which I shall be spending the remainder of this month and the duration of next month uploading videos of a certain spooky nature. So buckle in, buckos, because here we go. <laughs> to start things off with, I thought I would sink my teeth into a long-forgotten little morsel known as the Ketchup Vampire. Now, at this point, many of you may be wondering to yourselves what on earth it is that I could be referring to. And it's for this very reason that I have chosen this piece of mysterious media to be my first review for this series. You see, I myself had almost forgotten about this one. And if it hadn't have been for a lucky find at a toy show of all places, I very likely would have. To give a little backstory, when I was younger, there was this channel on television known as Fox Family that would air all manner of random children's shows from the 80s and 90s. And one such show happens to be this one right here. Now at this point, many of you are probably questioning, those of you who actually are aware of this thing, that, wait, this was a show? And my answer to you simply is, yes, this was a show. Originally called Die Ketchup Vampire in Germany, this show, which is extremely hard to find information on here in the States, was originally brought over by a company called Kidpix Incorporated, distributed by Celebrity Home Entertainment Incorporated under their Just For Kids Home Video banner. Getting confused yet? Well, hang on to your brainstem, because there's more! You see, folks, this movie is actually just a supercut of the animated series. Yes, you heard that right, ladies and gents. They literally imported an entire animated series from Germany, chopped it up into itty-bitty bite-sized pieces, and then cobbled together what they could into some Frankenstein's monster of a sloppy hour-and-a-half narrative that they decided to pass off as a film. Now, you may be wondering at this point how it is that I know any of this, if information on this series is so hard to come by. Well, that's because yours truly, through the powers of the internet, managed to track down and watch the entire first season of this thing right here on YouTube. By the way, links in the description below. You're welcome. And well, from what I've seen, this film only hits on the most basic of plot points, which go as follows. 1. There are two different breeds of vampire. One that prefers to drink ketchup and eat tomatoes, or tomatoes if you're into that sort of thing and one that prefers the more traditional vampiric dish of blood sausages. Now I'm assuming that they went with blood sausages in place of the traditional method, as it wouldn't have done well, being that this was a kid's show, to show the vampires drinking the blood of their victims through the chomping out of their jugular veins. Two, the ketchup vampires stole an old book penned by Dracula himself that was supposed to be used as a guideline for raising up the next generation of blood sausage vampires. Three, the blood sausage vampires are being led by a doddering old coot who is apparently trained by Dracula himself, but by this point in the story is so old that he has trouble remembering much of anything, let alone his own name. Four, the ketchup vampires are still in possession of this book and the blood sausage vampires want it back, and the ketchup vampires don't want them to have it back. Five, the two groups battle, clash, and hijinks ensue. Now, honestly, I'm actually kind of impressed with how well they were able to cobble together a narrative out of clips of a 26 episode long, two season series. So some degree of credit needs to go to the editors who worked on this thing. For an example of what I'm talking about here, let's go ahead and take a look at the start of this flick, shall we? 
Okay, so after the intro credits play, and we get that odd song about just how cool these vampires are, the movie starts off with a clip from the end of episode 4, then cuts to a clip from the start of the same episode, then it cuts to a clip from the start of episode 5, then a clip from the middle of episode 9, a clip from the start of episode 12 plays next, and so on and so forth for the duration of this film. And mind you, all of those aforementioned clips took place within the span of the first minute. That would be the equivalent of taking all the episodes of Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation and chopping it up into a movie where the turtle teens forsake Splinter and go and join the Foot Clan who is now being led by Dragon Lord, after he has Venus take out the Shredder using her special chi powers, and then they all go out for ice cream. All the while Samuel L. Jackson narrates what's happening on screen. So anyways, Twilight Beta is more of a fanfiction based off of the series than it is anything else. It has very little to do with the actual show, aside from the title and the main cast of characters, and it leaves out major plot points like the Ketchup Vampire's origin being linked back to Dracula's book, The Matura Vampira, which contains a recipe for a blood substitute derived from tomatoes, or tomatoes, again if that's your thing the origin of the blood feud between Hilga and Margaret over from Maurice, the fact that the professor originally forbids Pino from seeing his granddaughter Bella, and that Pino disregards this to attend a Halloween-slash-costume party where he finds out that she's going to be specifically to meet up with her, the fact that Huberta and Siegfried are brother and sister, along with the fact that they were originally both blood sausage vamps until Siegfried was made to drink some of Maurice's ketchup to try and keep up the act that he and his sister weren't blood sausage eaters, and after Huberta finds out, she despises him. Honestly, there's too much to list in even this one review. This film has so many visual and plot-based inconsistencies that it's not even funny. Okay, so now that I've gotten all of that nonsense out of my system, let's move on to actually discussing the film itself. We start off with some narration by Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, as she announces her presence. Then we get to the main theme song, which I honestly didn't care for at first, but like a bad rash, it's grown on me during the multiple times I've had to hear it during this research. Although, I will say that I prefer the original German opening, it has a lot more of a spooky atmosphere than this one does, and this one's sorely lacking for a film about vampires. Anyways, then we get more of Elvira's narration, as she gives us a quick introduction to the characters, and we're talking blink-and-you'll-miss-it levels of speed here, followed by a very quick telling of current events as they play across the screen. Those events being the whole crew working together to fix up the old ketchup processing and bottling factory that's on the grounds of Castle Ravenstein. It's never explained why it's there, it's just one of those things that gets glossed over to keep the video moving. Oh, and I should also mention that the people responsible for this thing also felt that it was necessary to add some musical numbers like, we're gonna fix up the factory jingle, and the ever memorable whack em, crack em, we'll attack him with squishy old tomatoes. So anyway, we jump from them fixing up the factory to Pino going through an old trunk that belongs to his parents, where he stumbles upon the book of Dracula's teachings, aka the Matura, and gets his mother to spill the beans, which she does and tells him the story of the book along with some of the backstory of their origin. We learn here that it was herself and Maurice who stole a book about 33 years ago and forsook using their fangs for blood drinking and how their stealing of the book eliminated a whole generation of bloodsuckers. We also find out that it's just about time for the next Matura ceremony, so they must take even more precautions to keep the book safely hidden, as the blood sausage vamps will be looking for it even more fiercely than ever. After this, we get to see Margaret's cousin, the Contessa Hilga, at her castle in Transylvania, and see that she has been receiving letters regarding the upcoming Matura Vampira ceremony. She gets interrupted when her servant, Boli, comes in to announce Ricardo's arrival. She goes to greet him, and he introduces himself. At least he would have if the editing here weren't so sloppy. And we find out that his servant has seen the book that she's been looking for, the Matura in an old book belonging to Margaret. But we also learn that he left it behind, not thinking it was anything special, 
describing it as being very old and dusty, to which Hilger promptly responds by trying to wring his scrawny little neck. Ricardo intervenes and tells her that if the book means that much to her, that he will go and get it himself. They devise a plan to use the students attending Hilga's castle to gain entry to the grounds of Castle Ravenstein, where the book is currently being hidden by Margaret and her husband Maurice and their son Vampino, Pino for short, to search for it. At this point, we get introduced to the old master along with Huberta and baby Chubby, whom Huberta is forced to babysit and was forced to bring with her to class. The baby starts crying and gets Huberta kicked out of class, so she goes and complains to Hilga, who just gets irritated with her and more so with the baby when he starts destroying her desk. So she sends Huberta back to class along with the baby. Next we get a jump cut to the night when Ricardo and the students begin their journey to Castle Ravenstein. The students are being instructed to disguise themselves using black paint on their fangs and neckerchiefs around their necks. They're also made to make up excuses about some kind of bad cold in the area, as an excuse for their neckerchiefs. We then transition over to Castle Ravenstein, where it turns out that the professor has just received a check along with word of the arrival of Professor Olsky, Ricardo, and his students, which is great news for the professor as we find out that he was on the verge of having to sell the castle. Which doesn't quite make sense here, given the fact that we just had that little song number about them fixing up the old factory. What do you do? Blow all his money on all those machines? It certainly couldn't have been spent on those tomatoes, because as we find out here in a few minutes, those are being grown right there on the factory grounds. Anyways... We find this out through a brief scene with the professor dancing around with a check, just as Bell is coming up the stairs to visit him in his lab. We cut from there to Ricardo's arrival, where he actually gets to introduce himself as Professor Olsky. He and the students then immediately excuse themselves to their quarters for the night. Bella and Leopold make some comments about them, while they are still clearly within earshot, rude, regarding their neckerchiefs and their pale skin. The professor waves it off as them just being tired from their trip, and the domestic trio leaves. Inside the bunk, we cut to a clip of Ricardo reminding the students again to conceal the fact that they are vampires, to keep their eyes open for the book, and then he proceeds to follow that up by making a comment about them being too pale and telling them to go get a moon pan. This scene is then immediately followed up by the little idiots flying around in plain view of anybody who should happen to look outside. Obviously, the little idiots get themselves spotted by none other than our hero Pino and he pieces together what's going on in about the most awkward way I have ever seen. Just, just look and see for yourselves. This is ridiculous. Those students are vampires. Blah, blood sausage. If all they ever eat is blood sausage, there's no doubt in my mind they all want to be blood suckers. But what are they looking for? Ah, now I know. I bet they're looking for that book. Yeah, no ship, Cap'n Crunch. What else do you think they're here for? Do you think they flew all the way from Transylvania just to get some of your rank ketchup for their hot dogs? He goes off to tell his parents about his discovery. By the way, these must be some of the most paranoid vampires ever. Just because there are some other vampires around who just happen to be messy eaters and like to eat blood sausage, they obviously must be after the book. For all these dorks know, these newcomers might have just been here on vacation. Also, I'd like to point out this bit right here, where we see Margaret has clearly cleaned up this egg mess and Maurice moving a pot from the stove onto the stairs before Pino comes in. But then the mess and the pot return to their previous positions after Pino tells them the news. Okay, then we get some back and forth between Pino and his parents, where we learn that he's in love with Bella. After this revelation, we cut once again to Hilga's castle in Transylvania, where Boli is in the kitchen looking after baby Chubby. He randomly shows Chubby that he can fly. The act delights the little onion-headed goober to no end. Another jump cut has Hilga and Huberta discussing going to Ravenstein Castle and getting the book themselves. Hilga concocts a scheme in which she will pose as the widow of a wealthy baron who collected rare and valuable books. Boli comes in to see them on their way, and Hilga gets mad at him for being too slow and being so distracted by that baby. 
As punishment for this, Huberta decides to take baby Chubby with them. Hilga likes this idea, as she knows that her sister loves babies, and devises that they could use Chubby as a distraction while they look for the book. With that settled, they fly off with the baby in tow. They're followed not too long after this by Bully, who just can't stand to be without his little chubby bear. Welcome back to me, my little chubby bear. <laughs> Your Uncle Bully won't be long. I promised you that, boy. So don't worry a little head about it. We then cut to the professor and Siegfried hiding the book, which is now randomly missing its cover, in an old cell in the dungeon in the basement of the castle. And then, because Siegfried is a heavyset character and this animation came out in the 90s, Siegfried quips about how he's going to go and get something to eat because he's starving after all this. Another jump cut has us watching Huberta spying on the ketchup vampires as they're about to sit down to a dinner which Siegfried has prepared. Huberta pops in offering them the baby before just shoving him into Margaret's arms along with a bottle of pureed blood sausage and takes off. They immediately ditch that nasty stuff and Maurice starts to make some baby ketchup. By the way, he winds up asking for flavor ideas for this concoction and gets the following suggestions. Pino says honey, Siegfried suggests milk, then Margaret adds her two cents by saying they should also add, quote, a little bit of vanilla. Maurice rolls with these suggestions, and so Baby Chubby gets a bottle of honey, milk, and vanilla-flavored baby ketchup. Now let this sink in, folks. Ketchup for the babies that tastes like milk, honey, and vanilla. And here I thought the pizza topping choices of the Ninja Turtles were weird. Wait a minute. Misfits, who are unable to exist in human society, who eat tomato-based foods, and who happen to have a female who is of the human variety that they hang around with on a regular basis, my god. Is the Ketchup Vampires one of those long lost Ninja Turtle knockoff shows from Germany? Now then, after whatever that was, we find ourselves with Hilga and Ricardo in the middle of a conversation about why it is that she's there. Which boils down to her being impatient and Ricardo taking too long. She then puts herself in charge of the whole operation. Another jump cut lands us with Bella and Uncle Leopold, who is apparently in a foul mood because he got rejected from another dinner theater group. Bella came in to ask if their dinner was ready, to which Leopold starts off with how he's in a black mood, and then on the fly comes up with black bread and black tea for dinner. For some reason, Bella thinks this is hilarious. Oh wait, she's a blonde character in a 90s kids cartoon. Uh, it's starting to make sense now why she's so giggly and airheaded. I'm glad we're beyond this phase of characters, aren't you folks? Anyways, she takes the food to their new guest, the Baroness Bloody Mirsky, Hilga, who proceeds to tell her about her mission of buying old and valuable books in order to carry on her late husband's legacy. And then she winds up to asking Bella if she knows if there are any around the castle that they would be interested in selling. Next we cut to another scene where Ricardo is scolding Huberta for not having asked about the book when she dumped off the baby on Margaret. So impatient old Hilga puts on her mourning veil and charges down to inquire about it herself. She and the students go down to visit the ketchups, all the while she's still under the guise of the Baroness, not long after she invites herself in, Baby Chubby recognizes her and pulls off her veil, revealing her true identity to Margaret. Hilga becomes furious at this and takes him to hold for ransom until she gets that book, while the students stay behind to make sure that no one follows after her and the baby. As she is storming off, she adds that she wants Maurice back as well, and then she cackles and leaves. At this point, the plot remembers that Bully exists, 
and we get to see his fat self making his way to the castle, Ravenstein, to rescue the baby. After that brief reminder about Boley, and I do mean brief as he literally appears on screen for only a total of 11 seconds here, we see the ketchup vamps as they deal with the loss of Chubby. Even though the baby had only been there for a few hours, at least I think it was only a few hours, given that this thing mostly takes place at night, it's pretty hard to tell the passage of time here. They're so distraught about it that even Siegfried has lost his appetite. Maurice makes a comment about how he doesn't cook well when he's upset anyways, and the professor quietly tells Bella that it just needs a bit of garlic to punch it up. She gets upset by this and blurts out that the garlic is bad for vampires. At the mention of garlic, Siegfried remembers a recipe in Dracula's book. That recipe can make vampires immune to garlic. They use this to immunize themselves, and then Maurice laces a bottle of wine with garlic juice and arranges a midnight rendezvous with Hilga for that very night. Plan goes off almost without a hitch. He goes to meet up with her that evening, using their former love as a distraction to gain her trust. They toast to the life that they will lead together after he leaves Margaret. Hilga gulps down the whole glass of wine and the garlic knocks her out cold. After this, we get a scene where Huberta and Ricardo are down in the dungeon at the door to the cell that the book has been hidden within. Somehow or another, Huberta got a big bottle which contains some kind of disappearing formula, which they then use on the door. It works and Ricardo goes inside for the book, while leaving Huberta outside to stand guard. Upon getting his hands on the book, Ricardo's curiosity gets the better of him, and he begins reading the book instead of just leaving right then and there. After a few moments, though, the hole in the door starts closing up with him still inside. Huberta tries to warn him, but it is too late. Then she freaks out and flies off to find help. We then get another jump cut to Pino, as he's finishing tying up Hilga in a barrel, while Maurice gloats about how easy it was to trick her. Suddenly, Siegfried comes in holding a bat and yelling about how the vampire students are planning an attack. If this seems at all confusing to you, it would be because there were several scenes here that were cut involving Huberta. There was a scene where Baby Chubby learns how to fly and promptly uses this knowledge to escape from the tower he was being held in. The reason that bat was holding that bottle was because he was the one who was supposed to be watching over the baby while he was being held captive. And then the scene where Siegfried finds the tower the bat was in where he was supposed to be watching after the baby. And I'm, I'm sure there's more here, but this all took place around episode 13, which was the last episode I was able to find online, so the rest is unknown to me. Anyways. So then Siegfried is questioned about the baby's whereabouts. He admits that he doesn't know where Chubby is, and just then, a writer's convenience, <coughs> I mean baby Chubby, flies in through the open window. Margaret is obviously overjoyed to see the baby is safe, as are Pino and Maurice. Siegfried calls out for them to grab their garlic, and has a weird scene transition where suddenly everyone is there. The Professor, Bella, Uncle Leopold, Margaret, Pino, Maurice, and baby Chubby? All armed to the teeth pun intended, with tomatoes, garlic cloves, and garlic water. Huberta and her crew, made up entirely of the vampire students, are only armed with blood sausages. She then sends them off and promptly leaves them to their fate with Pino and company, while she goes off to get ready to return to Transylvania, where she intends to become the new Contessa of the Castle. Obviously, the students get creamed and tied up along with Hilga, and I should mention that this fight scene is where that squishy old tomatoes song came in. Huberta is all set to go when she sees that all the other blood sausage vampires have indeed been defeated and captured. She goes to take off and gets intercepted by Boley of all people. He stops her from escaping and hands her over to Pino and crew. Off screen, of course. Now we cut over to the crazy old master in Transylvania just as he's about to make a big discovery. Dracula's ruby ring. It turns out it was hidden in the same chamber as the Matura Vampira this whole time. It was in a stalactite just overhead of the pedestal where the book used to be. And yes, I had to look that up, and I'm sure it's stalactite, not stalagmite. 
Upon finding it, he remembers and recites a rather catchy little nursery rhyme about it, then puts it on and uses it to call upon the powers of Dracula and makes himself young again. Shortly after this, some of the castle guests who are there for the Matura Vampira ceremony and who must have arrived and been introduced sometime in season two come down to the hall where the old master is and find him in his newly revamped state. Pun unintended. At this point, one such guest, called Uncle Theo, speaks up. I swear he sounds far too much like what it would be like if Henchman 21 from the Venture Brothers had a lisp. Every time he spoke up, I kept expecting him to say, Oh, I gotta get back to the monarch. <laughs> <laughs> and says the following in a not too surprised or enthusiastic tone. Something's happened. He has changed. Another character from this trio pipes up far more enthusiastically and says, Quite right. Yet you fall, the master could barely remember his own name. After he has an audience, the old master thinks to ask the ring about the prophecy, and we get to find out that Pino is a descendant of Dracula, and that if he and Huberta get together and he puts on the ring, he will become the Renewer and save the blood sausage vampires. Next we jump cut again and find ourselves back at Castle Ravenstein, right outside the ketchup factory to be precise, where Boley had Huberta tied up and hanging from the loft outside. At the same time we find that her bat Hugo has found himself a nice little female bat named Rosie to be with. Boley gets distracted by baby Chubby, which allows Huberta enough time to escape which she does, and goes off to find Hugo, which she does, after talking with Hilga's bat, Goldie, or is it Gordy? With Hilga's accent, it's legitimately hard to tell, and she's the only one to say it so far. So Huberta sees Hugo making out with Rosie through the window, and proceeds to chase her off, then catches Hugo and ties him up. She's about to take off for Transylvania when Rosie comes back and attacks, biting Huberta on the leg. This, of course, comes after she reveals to the viewers that she and Hugo are married. Huberta quickly yanks Rosie off of her calf and ties her up before taking off for home. Back in Transylvania, Huberta arrives and Hugo gets loose and tries to get away from her, wanting nothing more than to go back to Rosie. Huberta is having none of this and chases him all over the castle, somehow managing to end up down in the Matura Hall where she catches up with Hugo and starts yelling and screaming at him. The old master and the guests who have apparently just been standing there listening to the ring's prophecies are insulted that she would just barge in there like that in the middle of their gathering. The old man reprimands her for her actions and then reveals to her that she has a role to play in the prophecy. He commands the ring to repeat itself and she finds out that she is to make Pino kiss her and then get him to put on Dracula's magic ring. Doing this would transform him into the Renewa that he is destined to become but Huberta gets majorly distracted after the part about getting to kiss Pino. While Huberta is going all goo-goo-eyed, we cut back to Rosie at Castle Ravenstein as she frees herself and goes off to find Goldie, or Gordy, to ask him for directions to Transylvania. He mocks her, she cries, and then he tells her that if she lets him out of his cage, that he'll tell her how to get there. She falls for this, and once he's free, he chases her off and spies on the ketchup vampires who have apparently just forgotten about Hilga and the rest of the blood sausage vampires down in the room beneath them. By the way, why has no one mentioned or brought up the fact that Professor Ofsky, Ricardo, has also gone missing this whole time? Again, I know, I know the questions, I need to stop. Anyways, Hilga's bat swoops off to spy on the ketchup vamps just as the professor is about to show off his latest invention. A formula that is supposed to make things grow. Instead, it makes the tomato he was using to test it shrink down to the size of a cherry. While Pino and company are distracted by the professor and his goof-up, Gordy slash Goldie sneaks over and steals the formula. He takes it back to Hilga with the intention of using it to free her by shrinking her enough to slip out of her bindings. All the while, Rosie is watching from outside the window. The plan works a little too well, and Hilga is reduced to the size of a bat. This causes her to start yelling at Gordy slash Goldie, and as she does so, she lets slip that they're planning to head back to Transylvania, and this little factoid catches the attention of Rosie. The tiny Contessa convinces Goldie slash Gordy that they need to rescue Ricardo first, since he has the book. 
and so off they fly. Although I'm still curious to know how they knew where he was. But it must have been in one of those scenes that they cut for the film. So anyways, regardless, they head off to save Ricardo. They reach the dungeon to find Ricardo shaking the bars to the door of his cell and yelling about, He's going mad, I tell you, mad! They calm him down when they tell him that they are there to set him free. He is so happy to hear this that he points out the fact that Hilga is now little. She tells him to shut up, and the bat gives him the shrinking formula. Hilga reminds him to grab the book, which he does, but then the dim bulb goes and drops the silly thing after using the shrinking formula on himself, and they wind up having to leave it behind unless they want to get themselves caught in their tiny state. As they're flying away, Rosie chases after them, still desperate to find her mate Hugo again. They manage to make it back to Transylvania after much difficulty since, as Ricardo pointed out, they're one-sixth their normal size, and they have to travel six times as far. Once they get there, and after a rather rough landing, Hilga starts complaining about how she's hungry to death, so she and Ricardo fly off into the castle to get some food, and this is where they start to realize just how badly it sucks to be only six inches tall in a world meant for much larger beings. Much to the delight of Gordy slash Goldie, who starts chuckling when Hilga has to get Ricardo's help to try and ring the bell for her servant. As the teeny duo are busy with that, Huberta comes into the dining hall with Uncle Theo, talking about how she's going to be the queen of the vampires. This shocks Hilga and Ricardo, who fly over to confront her in the middle of her meal of blood sausages. Huberta just mocks them for their tiny size and then locks them up in a cage. She then gets called away and leaves the pair in their new home. Next we see Rosie flying all around the castle looking for Hugo, all the while some cheesy song is playing in the background that goes a little like this. Here I come, don't despair, it's going to take the power of love and I'll be there. Do any of you out there know how to make syrup? Because I'm going to need to figure out something to do with all this sap. So they finally get reunited, and they start working together to free Hugo from the cage that Huberta had tossed him in earlier. While that's happening, the old master and the rest of the group, including Huberta, have just been told another part of the prophecy off-screen, which the old master reiterates for the sake of the viewer. Huberta is supposed to be transformed to look like Bella to more easily trick Pino into kissing her. Their first attempt kind of reminds me of Beetlejuice and Drag. And the ghost with the most pain. The second try works, and she actually looks just like Bella. The only problem here is that she still has her normal voice, so she's going to have to pull a little bit of an Ariel and lure Pino using mostly body language, to quote Ursula. After this, we cut back to Hugo and Rosie as they finally manage to get him out of his cage. Rosie chooses this moment, of all times, to reveal to him that she's pregnant, they fly off somewhere in the cave, and we cut to Bella and Pino, somewhere in Castle Ravenstein for some reason, only to quickly transition back to Huberta, flying to the castle. She lands and sneaks off to find Pino, which she does in the tomato garden, kissing with Bella and proclaiming his love for her. They leave because Pino remembers that he was supposed to help the professor with one of his experiments, and Huberta finally rescues the students. Yeah, you remember those chuckleheads? then immediately divulges the plan to capture Bela, swap places with her, and use herself as bait. Between Pino flying off and Huberta coming to the rescue of the students, Bella returns to the garden to inventory the tomatoes. Huberta and the boys start to sneak up on her, but Pino comes back just to give her another kiss. Aww. I swear, I have never, never seen such a thirsty vampire in all my life. Anyways, he bugs off and then Bella is promptly captured by Huberta and her goon squad, although she does put up a decent struggle at first. Ultimately, she gets tied up in a bag and Huberta's crew sets off for Transylvania. Here we get a scene with Hugo and Rosie just relaxing together when Huberta and company arrives, and Rosie convinces Hugo to go and see what's going on. He reluctantly agrees and heads off while saying, This is too much for an expectant father to handle. Thanks to him, we get to see Huberta and the students literally dropping off Bella on the floor before the old master. 
He starts to congratulate the boys before Huberta interrupts him and asserts that she is the reason why they were able to get Bella in the first place. The students are then dismissed, and Huberta is then instructed to release Bella so that he can get a look at her. Huberta obeys, and Bella is let out of the bag. The old master is thoroughly unimpressed by what he sees. Then, for whatever reason, he and Huberta blab their plans to her, and she hilariously dismisses the idea by simply saying that she won't allow it. <laughs> I just love how she thinks she has any say in the matter here. The old master is irritated by this, and Hugo spouts off with, She needs more help than I can give her, and flies off to get Rosie. Meanwhile, the old master starts showing off some of the ring's powers, and Bella loses much of her bravado, and starts realizing just how deep in trouble she really is. She's taken away to the dungeon by two of the male Matura Vampira guests, as commanded by the old master, while Huberta quips that she makes a better Bella than Bella, while Hugo and Rosie watch on helplessly. We get to see Bella thrown into a cell before we cut back to Castle Ravenstein, where it's just been figured out that she is missing. And while everyone is looking for her, Siegfried finds out that the students are all missing. I mean, seriously, just how inept are these dorks? Seriously. Pino, yet again using his brilliant deductive skills, pieces together that it must have been the students who took Bella. Gee, I wonder how it is he came to that conclusion. Crypty, what did you do? I guess those two just had a bit of a falling out. Really? That's what you gotta say for yourself? Alright. No Dr. Dreadful Scream Lab for you tonight. So, as I was saying... So our hero then swears that he's going to save her. Next we cut to the Transylvania Castle, where Bella is being held captive, and she is lamenting over the fact that she is so friggin' dumb. I mean, over the fact that she's being used as bait for her beloved Pino. Hugo tries to cheer her up by telling her the news that he's now a father, and thanks to him we get to find out that Rosie has just given birth to triplets, who he names off as Mick, Mac, and Mary. The little ones can apparently be seen from where Bella's cell is, as evidenced by the fact that after Hugo tells her about the babies, she comments on them being so cute, before congratulating Hugo and Rosie and welcoming the babies into the world. So again, uh, about that syrup recipe? Uh, you don't happen to know one, do you? After that, we cut again to Ravenstein Castle, where Maurice is trying to convince Pino to try his latest invention, an energy ketchup, before he leaves. Pino declines, saying that he's just eaten, which you would think that Maurice would know, considering that he does about 90% of the cooking around there, but I digress. Then Margaret asks the legitimate question about if Pino is sure he knows the way to Transylvania. He reassures her that he does, and she, along with Maurice, Bolly, and Baby Chubby, wish him on his way as he flies off to find Bella. Next, we cut to the Professor and Siegfried in the lab. It turns out that the old kook wants to help search for his granddaughter as well, and Siegfried has just the thing from Dracula's book, a formula that can turn people into bats. After watching Siegfried mix a bunch of stuff together, the professor chugs it down and transformative hijinks ensue. At first, he only winds up with pointy ears, but then Siegfried mixes up a second, more potent batch, and after some more hijinks, he finally becomes a little bat. With a balding head, but uh, still a bat? And he flies off to find Transylvania along with his granddaughter, Bella. After quite possibly the millionth cut in the film, we see that Bella is still locked up in her cell, only now Huberta is back and mocking her again, proclaiming that Pino is now hers, and blah, 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 blah. The bats overhear all of this, and Mac gets sick of Huberta's mouth, wouldn't we all, and flies down to attack her and get her to shut up. He gets caught by her, and Hugo has to fly in to rescue him. He starts attacking Huberta, which gets her to release his son, then they evade her attempts to recapture them until she gets called away. She calls back to them, saying that she'll be back. Before she leaves, though, she takes another shot at Bella by reminding her of the kissing ceremony that will make Pino hers. 
Bela cries, and the bats swoop in to try and console her. Pino arrives outside, and is spotted by the old master along with Huberta, who starts swooning over him yet again. They head inside as Pino tries to figure out how to get into the castle. The old master transforms Huberta into Bella again. He then tells her the specifics about the kissing ceremony, but seems to lose her again at the mention of her kissing Pino, and how that will make him hers forever. Okay, so now I've officially seen the thirstiest vampire. He reminds her not to speak, as her voice would be a dead giveaway. Meanwhile, we find out that Baby Bat Mac had been listening in on their conversation the whole time, and he flies off in a panic to alert the others to Pino's arrival, and to warn them about Huberta's disguise plan. By this point, our boy Pino has made his way to the castle, and enters through an unlocked door. Shortly after he arrives, we see that the batty professor has made it as well. He overhears some other bats talking, and finds out that Pino is also there. The other bats see him, after a spectacularly botched landing attempt, and become immediately suspicious, but are just as quick to pass him off as being harmless due to him being too old to do any harm. He takes off into the castle to continue looking for Bella. Somehow he manages to make it all the way to the Matura Hall, like everybody else, and lands his tired old bat butt in Hugo and Rosie's nest. Initially, they are also suspicious of him, but he disregards their threatening demeanor and is surprised to find that they have kids now. At this point in the movie, after nearly an hour and 20 minutes, we find out that the professor's name is Edgar. Edgar! Why they waited this long into the movie to tell the viewer about this fact is far beyond me. He gets excited when he sees Bella and zips over to her cell. Somehow she recognizes him. I'm guessing it was the mammal pattern baldness that gave him away. And the Bat family then, and only then, accepts that he is who he claims to be. He starts telling them about what's going on just as we cut away to Pino again. He steps through a door, which crumbles behind him, and sees Hugh Bella being attacked by some bats. He initially falls hook, line, and sinker for this, even though Huberta's impression of Bella's voice is spotty at best. He rushes off to save her from the bats. He shoots them off, almost too easily. Then Hugo shows up and thwarts Hugh Bella's attempts to get Pino to kiss her. This ticks her off royally, and Huberta's true colors and voice shine through as she starts yelling at him. This instantly breaks the illusion for Pino, and the jig is up for Huberta. Pino wraps her up in his cape and uses it to tie her up. With her incapacitated, he starts casually talking with Hugo, who tells him where the real Bella is, along with what the blood sausage vampire's plans are. They start off with Hugo leading the way to the dungeon. At this point, we get a scene where Professor Edgar uses some of his disappearing formula to get rid of the lock on the cell door, and they manage to free Bella just as Pino and Hugo make their way into the dungeon. They put Hugh Bella in the cell in the real Bella's place. Now while this is going on, Uncle Theo comes into the dining room where Hilga and Ricardo's shrunken selves are still being held in their little birdcage prison to bring them to the kissing ceremony. We now cut back to Pino tying up Hugh Bella in the cell. Once he's done with that, he explains to the professor about their plans to trick the blood sausage vampires into giving Dracula's ring to them. He goes on to add that once they have the ring in hand, they will be heading back to Ravenstein, along with Hugo and Rosie and the triplets. They head out for the ceremony after making sure that Hugo and his family are all set to go. We now switch over to the location where the kissing ceremony is to take place, just as the ivy-leafed ratfoot flowers are beginning to bloom and signal that the time for the ceremony is drawing near. The blood sausage vampires take this as a good omen, then we find ourselves back in the dungeon where Huberta is on the verge of getting herself out of her bindings. The bats aren't paying any attention to her, but then Little Mac, no, not that Little Mac, notices what's happening and calls to the others for help. Next we cut back to see the blood sausage vampires being told again about what's going on. I suppose makes more sense in the series, considering it was more than likely on a bi-weekly basis and they would have to inform the viewer between episodes what happened. But this here kind of repetitious exposition gets really old really quickly. So, Pino and Bella get there right on time. But Bella stops Pino while they're still out of sight, thankfully, just to tell him again that she loves him. 
Directly after this, we get switched back over to the dungeon where Huberta is still undoing the bindings around her ankles, while the bats are holding the door to the cell shut and hoping slash waiting for the disappearing formula to wear off so that the lock will grow back and keep Huberta locked up inside. It takes too long for the lock to reform, however, and Huberta knocks the door open and in the process sends the bats flying before making a break for it. The bats trip her up with some rope. The fall seemingly knocks her out, and they tie up her legs with the same rope before they fly off. Back at the ceremony, Pino and Bela play their parts perfectly and manage to get the ring. But when Bela puts it onto Pino's finger and nothing happens, the old master realizes that something is up. At the same time, the power of the ring that made him young again starts fading away. At this point, Huberta has recovered and untied herself again off screen and shows up at the ceremony just in time to see Pino and Bella fly off. She lunges after them to stop them, but because she's still in her Hugh Bela form, she isn't able to fly and just flops to the ground in a heap where the two lovebirds had been standing only a moment ago. The bats celebrate, and the old master is now old and senile again. Huberta throws a tantrum like the spoiled brat that she is while transforming back into her true form, but is so distraught that she doesn't think to fly after them. The bats rejoice again. Huberta calms down but still lays there wallowing in her own self-pity. The bats finally take flight and catch up with Pino and Bela as Pino is suffering from some awkward animation in his arms. Huberta goes back to weeping and sobbing, only now she's moved on to the balcony with everyone else. The old master has completely forgotten about the whole kissing ceremony, and one of the guests comments on his senility by saying that, Without the ring of Dracula, he's once again a few sandwiches short of a picnic. You can guess who that one was. And he replies by saying that he could go for some sandwiches, and asks what kind they've got. Huberta gets mad at the fact that he's gone senile again, and that now they're going to have to make their own plans. Now we cut back to Castle Ravenstein, where... Baby Chubby tells everyone that Pino and Bella are back? Wow. Okay, so I guess a tomato and ketchup based diet is really good for a baby's cognitive development. <laughs> Who knew? Baby ketchup, does it body good? <laughs> Finally, they've come back. Oh, wonderful. I always knew that Pino could do it. Anyways, this news greatly delights the others, who drop everything and rush out to greet them. Margaret finally finds out about Professor Edgar's batty transformation, along with Maurice. They're also a bit surprised that Hugo and Rosie are there, as well as the fact that they've got kids. The group shares a laugh about Little Mick's narcolepsy. They then decide to celebrate the victory over the blood sausage vampires, along with the return of Bella and Pino with... What else? A mother and ketchup party! They go inside to start the festivities, and then this thing just ends. Yep! And that's it. There's nothing else. The end credits start scrolling up that screen, accompanied with what I assume to be an alternate version of that song from the beginning, which is, I should say, by far the best song in the special, but that's not really saying a whole lot, considering. But, yeah, then, then it's over. So, Spooks Fangs, what did y'all think of this flick? Did you feel a bang when they flashed their fangs? Or did this one merely leave you feeling drained? As for yours, Ghoulie, I feel that this particular video deserves the title of Shelf Sitter. So anyways, fangs for watching, and be sure to keep some tomatoes and cloves of garlic nearby because you never know when you're going to bump into a ketchup vampire. <laughs>